Thank you, Jenny Horn, for that. We had a slew of consumer and housing data out this morning. Let's break down what it means for our U.S. economy and bring in our panel. Aaron Sykes is with us, chief economist, Nest Seekers International, and Hiten Samtani, associate publisher of The Real Deal. Thank you both very much for being with us. There's some concern about where the consumer stands at this point. What stands out to you, Aaron, as you look at the housing data and how the consumer may be behaving. What does the housing data tell you? Is there a one-off? Is there a trend? So what I love about consumer data and housing data is how it really synergistically works together because it just boils down to how we spend our money. And we saw just before the commercial break that most of the larger home builders are down. And I'm not concerned about this with housing right now, but I am more concerned about the consumer dynamic because you have one leading indicator and one trailing indicator. I think general population has really started to notice their wallets getting thinner and they feel inflation. They haven't truly started to do anything about it yet. And I expect that to come in Q2 2022. That said, Simultaneously, many are using um, inflation or using real estate to hedge inflation. So we're seeing a continued strength in the real estate markets, particularly the hot markets like Palm Beach and Miami and the Hamptons. And I don't expect prices to drop anytime soon. I do expect a little bit more inventory to trickle in. And we still have two and a half million housing units across the nation that we need to make up for. So we're working with extreme shortages, supply and demand, and now inflation to boot. Uh, okay, Hatan, what are, what are the real deal readers expecting in your next issue as you're putting it together? What are some of the trends you're about to focus on? I think one of the incredible things is, as Aaron sort of mentioned, the luxury markets have been on fire. So in Manhattan, we saw that the luxury market, which is defined in Manhattan as 4 million and up, has already broken the record that was set in 2014. So we're talking about a year, it's just been about a year since, you know, the height of the pandemic, and we're already in record, record territory. Miami has just overtaken LA as the second most pricey market in the country. So there are these enclaves that seem to just have become magnets for the super rich. They've obviously been untethered from location when it comes to work. So it's all about play, it's all about lifestyle. And we've seen a lot of that happen. And just to, just to add to Aaron's point, I think if you think of confidence, it's a function of certainty and pricing power. With the Delta variant, you can't really have certainty. You don't know when things are opening. You don't exactly know what's happening next. And pricing power, as Aaron mentioned, has really hit the consumer hard. Everything from your Uber is a lot more expensive to your rents. Rents are up, I think, for professionally managed homes. Rents are up 13% year over year. That's a significant hit. I, I think you make a good point, Hatan, as we're, as we're looking at rents on the rise, too. And I think, Aaron, as we talk about this, one of the reasons why rents are on the rise is because I think, and you guys tell me, but I've heard it at least once that the, that some of the buyers were just priced out. They were priced out of houses that they wanted to buy. So then they turned to renting and now renting is super expensive. Um, does the consumer stay strong enough, even with inflation? Erin. I think we've got another six months of a strong consumer. Um, in terms of, of retail. I think we have a longer trajectory with a strong home buyer, and that is driven by that shortage that we mentioned earlier. So I totally agree with Hatan and the way that things are going in New York. New York is now the most expensive city to live, surpassing San Francisco. And then we also have that luxury market, which has been a nuance through this entire situation, where even though mortgage rates, people were getting two and a quarter percent, two and a half percent, two and three quarter percent loans, but they were still choosing to pay pay in cash in the luxury markets because of the extreme bidding wars going on in many of the hotter markets. So some of those people financed on the back end and they will carry those mortgages on, but then there is not going to be this giant fallout um, from the end of the mortgage moratorium on um, that luxury market because of those cash purchases. We might see a little bit of a pullback and some opportunity in the entry level market. So it's something to keep your eye out for, but I don't see this um, um, collapsing anytime soon.
Yeah. And it's, and I think it's interesting as we talk about what we're seeing in the trends. I mean, there are some who are, as we talk about, not paying rent, not paying their mortgages because they can't, they're struggling. And then you have this luxury group, the four million and up, breaking records. I mean, there's such a disconnect. And how much of it is contingent upon the interest rate picture? So you have a lot of success, particularly in the higher end. If rates creep higher, when will the ultra luxury buyers and sellers care? For the ultra luxury buyers and sellers, I don't think rates is going to be the reason they don't purchase that penthouse in Manhattan or that that ocean facing house in Palm Beach. It, it does help. It might make them pull the trigger on a 60 million home as opposed to maybe a 45 million home. But they're still buying those $45 million homes. You know, we talk a lot about a tale of two cities. Uh, it's really a tale of two Americas. There's that one America that has figured out that it's all about lifestyle now. And we're going to buy these things because they've, you know, there have been, we've seen buyers have come into Palm Beach nine months ago, bought a, bought a patch of dirt. And in nine months, they've made 60% on that dirt. And I'm talking millions of dollars in profit, right? So I don't, I don't necessarily think the interest rates are going to affect their residential purchases. Obviously, it, it does have a big impact in the commercial real estate market, which we can talk about. But, but I, I do want to challenge one more thing. Why don't you? I, I'm actually almost out of time, and I am interested in the commercial real estate market, particularly for people who invest in REITs. So give me a quick thought on that, Hussein. Well, the commercial real estate market, uh, the central business district, which is sort of your halting towers around Grand Central, that's where I feel like there's going to be the biggest question marks because there's no reason for someone to come in five days a week over and over, despite what the big landlords say, there's been a dramatic unbundling of work from location, right? So I think those office towers in sort of your prime down, downtown corridors in LA, New York, they are kind of there's a lot to be said about that. Obviously, big tech is buying up everything they can. So there's a temporary yeah. sort of mandate maybe, but it doesn't really, it doesn't really solve the, the problem. I enjoy our conversations. Thank you so much, Aaron and Hatan. What a great discussion we're having about these real life issues and trends that we're seeing. Aaron Sykes, Chief Economist, Nest Seekers International, and Hiten Samtani, Associate Publisher at The Real Deal. Thank you both.